This is that annoying Sandy Peterson again, and today we're going to talk about Sleeper, Sathagawa's faction. So first, Sathagawa sets up right here in North America, if you could aim down there for me. Here's his symbol, it's kind of brown, but technically his color is more of an orange. So he sets up there, he puts his gate down in the Kai, which according to Lovecraft is in Oklahoma. Um, and there is his beginning area. It's kind of off in the boondocks, kind of away from the other factions in the game. This is a little advantage for him in some games. Um, okay, so his faction ability is uh, Death from Below. During the uh, Doom phase, he can spawn a free monster anywhere he has a unit. It has to be his cheapest monster. So, for example, if he if uh, his cheapest monster is the um, wizards, so he would spawn a wizard. You know, if he didn't, ha if both wizards were on the map, he could spawn a serpent man. If all the wizards and serpent men were on the map, he could spawn a formless spawn, and uh, so he can kind of. Uh, ratchet his way up. And there's various uh, strategies for him based on trying to get a, 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 a costlier free monster during the death from below phase. Um, but basically it's a, it's, it's a minimum of one sort of free point of power every turn, and it, right? So that's kind of nice. Okay, so let's talk about his, uh, his critters. So he has, uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so he has 16 figures. He starts off, he has two of these guys. These are the wizards. And they're riding a huge uh, bat face thing with a really disgusting face. And these have a combat of zero and a cost one point. And they're your cheap guys. Uh, free, you can get one for free in the second turn or if you manage to summon them both the first turn then you can get a Superman instead. Here's the Serpent Man. They're a little better. They're a slim, slim line guy. If you look close, he's got like a cobra hood going for him, and uh, I really like him. So the Serpent Man uh, has one, rolls one combat dice, and uh, it costs two. So he's a little more, he's, you know, he can do something, unlike the wizard who is just there to be a, a soul coffee man. Then we have the Glory of the Formless Spawn. This is sort of your, your favorite unit. And the way the Formless Spawn works is it rolls three dice. Sorry. It doesn't roll three dice. It costs three power to summon. Now, the number of dice it rolls depends on how many formless spawn are in play. And it's equal to the number in play. Not in the area, just on the whole map. So if you have one, for your first formless spawn is only going to roll one die. When you have two formless spawns, each of them rolls two dice. When you have three, they each roll three dice. And when you get all four formless spawn on the map, they each roll four dice, which is uh, pretty good. So that's 16 dice for cost of 12. That's, uh, I'm not sure exactly how that uh, compares to the Nafka, but it's pretty close in terms of coolness. So you add the, keep adding these up, and you get a lot of power for them. Um, they have another function, which is the only way to get Sathagwa himself, which is your great old one, is to have a formless spawn on the map somewhere. And the way you get Sathagwa is you look for a place where you have a formless spawn, you pay... 8 power and place Sathagwa in the same area. Unlike, say, Yoxadoth, you don't lose the, the creature, you just, he just has to be placed with it. So, so, uh, it's, so you don't, your formless spawn stays there too, now he just has Sathagwa along with him for what that's worth. Now Sathagwa's um, combat is kind of interesting because it is equal to the power of his opponent. So early in the turn, when, when your opponent has a lot of power, he can roll a lot of dice. Later in the turn, when they have uh, spent their power or, you know, by uh, further away summoning monsters, building gates, and doing things, then his attack is a lot weaker. Um, so it also has the feature, though, that uh, when enemies come to fight Sathagwa, they are kind of scared of fighting them early in the turn when they have a lot of power because, you know, he'll roll a million dice. Now, this ability has a, another effect on him. Because of the nature of his, of his spell books and his special abilities, it turns out that he is very often the guy at the end of the game, at the end of the turn, with uh, the only person left with power. He can take several moves in a row. Well, of course, since someone else has power then, Sephagwa's combat dice at that point are pretty low. There's a minimum of, of two, so he always has at least two. But, uh, so he's kind of sad he doesn't roll a million dice. On the other hand, they can't do anything about his moving around and doing stuff. So I say if he wants to have lots of combat dice, 
summon the form will spawn, and they'll give him all he needs. I mean, two of these guys in one area, if you have all four on the map, roll eight dice, so, I mean, that's plenty for any rational need. Okay, how does he get his spell books? Well, he has kind of an interesting way of getting his spell books. Most of, oh, half of his spell books come as a result of him spending power. Oh, wait, almost forgot. The signature ability of Seth Agua, and one that really fits my Lazy Bone Sons, it's called Lethargy. And what it is, if Sathago is in play, you spend zero power on your action, do nothing. That's it. So you essentially pass and say, I am being lethargic. And then the next players go, and then you can pass again. And then, you, and then of course, what happens is that other players have to spend power every turn doing stuff while you sit there idly watching them, twiddling your thumbs, going in and getting a drink from the fr you know, a beer from the fridge or whatever. And then finally, when they're all out of power, then you spring into action and uh, use all that power you've hoarded to do terrible things to them. Now, uh, savvy players will see that you're doing this, and, and in an attempt to make you at least spend some power before the end of the turn, they will come and move you to an area so you have to respond, or you have to fight them, or you can do something. And uh, that's how it is. But, but, you're st but the lethargy is still affecting them, because they're doing something they maybe wouldn't have done otherwise, just to stimulate you to a response. So it's, it's pretty entertaining. Okay, so your spell books. Three of your spell books are spell books where you spend power to get an effect. So one of them is, as your action for the round, spend three power, and every other player gets one power, and then poof, you get a spell book. So the other players like that because they all get a power, so they kind of cheer you on at that point. And uh, you usually save that for a place when your power is pretty good and it won't help them that much, because uh, of course it helps them. Then you have an, another interesting one, which is as your action for the round, spend three power, one other player gets three power. I've seen South Agua, uh, the Wind Sleeper, try to use this to negotiate with people, saying, hey, if you don't uh, pick me for that Groth or, uh, or whatever, then uh, I'll give you the three power for the spell book. Or if you, or, you, know, if you point the uh, first turn marker at me or away from me, I'll give you three power. You know, there's various deals you can try to make. Um, or you can just pick the person who's furthest behind and give him three power so then he can play catch up. Um, which uh, will hurt you less than giving it to someone who is like way ahead. So that's that one. Then he has another one which is really fun, which is, again, spend three power. All these are spend three power for you. But this one, every other player loses a power. So they're sad when you do it and uh, you kind of cackle because, of course, you lost three power to their one, but you also got a spell book, so, you know, what the heck. Okay, so next, um, he gets a spell book when he rolls six or more combat dice in a single battle. Um, this is pretty easy to do if you have, if you have uh, uh, South Agawa in play. Otherwise, you want to have probably uh, three of these guys in play, this formal spawn, because then they'll each roll three dice, and two of them can roll the six dice. They don't just score any hits. All they got to do is roll six dice in a battle. It doesn't have to be a battle you declared, but usually it is, because like, nobody wants to fight you when you're going to be rolling six dice, so that's how that goes. Um, his last two, he gets a spell book when he does a Ritual of Annihilation. So this one always comes, because eventually you're going to do a Ritual anyway, or, you know, people that don't do Rituals don't usually win, so you're going to do a Ritual. And uh, it does inspire uh, Seth Agua to often do his Rituals a little earlier in the turn, because he wants to get the spell book, and he wants to pay less for it, so he tends to go ahead and bite that bullet on the second... I've seen him do it the second turn, um, but he does it fairly early, so he gets his, uh, that spell book. I'd say a first turn. Uh, my son says he's seen it the first turn. That is extreme, but yeah, it could happen. If you really want that spell book, you know. Although it seems it'd be, it'd only give you one, uh, uh, one doom point then. That's kind of yeah. sucky. They always lose if they do it, though. Okay, he also says they always lose if they do it. So, got that? Don't do the ritual violation the first turn. Second turn, though, is, can sometimes work. And the final one, as always, is summon your great old one. So, he summons Seth Agua, you get a spell book. Um, yay. Sathago is not usually the last guy to get his spell books. He's usually not the first either. He's somewhere in the middle, and the reason is because all those spell books where he has to spend three power to do it, so he kind of like, has to, he doesn't want to do this all in one turn, so he kind of parses about over several turns. Also, the spell book where he rolls six dice, you can't really do that early game, uh, so you have to wait for a little while until you can pull it off. So it's usually like the second or third turn when you can, when you can do that. So he's not the first, he's not the last, he's just you know, there in the mediocre middle. Okay, as far as spell books, not as far as a faction. Now, he is the most flexible faction of all the factions in play. You have so many things you can do with him, so many choices to make. 
and that's part of the fun because okay it starts with lethargy and it just keeps getting better so here's some of here's his spell books and we'll talk about a few of them so here we go this is another cost saver it's called burrow when you move two or more units then you get one power refunded let's turn the camera down to look at the map here i'm going to show how this works so so for example, let's say you have a, a wizard in Sethagawa here, and you want to move them to West Africa, where, sh where the mighty Shogunifon is, is lurking. Well, you move them there, that, that costs you two power to move two units, but then you get a refund of one because you have Burrow, so it only costs you one to move two units. Now, if you'd moved three units, you'd get a refund of one as well, so it'd cost you two. So the most cost-effective way for Sethagawa to move is to move two units at a time. So he tends to move in, in units of two, but sometimes you just have to move more guys because that's how life is in the big city. Okay, then he has Cursed Slumber. This is uh, a really useful thing. It reduces your footprint on the map and also kind of acts as a special way of getting more power. And it... Uh, Zoom down here some more. Oh, cursed Sorry, slumber. we're going to be doing this more. Okay, so we're going to be looking down here at the map for a while. So Cursed Slumber costs you one power. You pick up your gate with the cultist, and you put it here on your faction sheet. And then it just stays there. And uh, it still counts towards your power and your doom points. It's completely immune to anything that other players can do. And in fact, you can then go ahead and build a new gate behind on the next turn. So you can cut So then you can... So, you know... You have basically a gate off the map, so you don't have to have as many areas on the map. They can't get to that gate. Now, for one power on a later turn as an action, you can take that gate with the cultus on it and put it anywhere on the map that there isn't a gate. So you can essentially move a gate anywhere on the map for two power and two actions. Take it off in the first action and put it down in the second. Um, quite often, they will just take the cursed lumber and take it off and put it on their... Uh, um, on their spell book and just leave it there forever. But sometimes there's a reason you want to pump it down somewhere else. For example, uh, I've seen players make a, use it, turn their home area into a gate creating factory where they curse lumber gate for one, then pop it down, say, in Arabia for one, then they build a new gate, then they curse lumber that, then they put that somewhere, then they build a new gate, and they keep... This way they don't have to go move somewhere to build a gate. They can just, like, be teleporting around the map. So uh, it's expensive, but sometimes it's, like, a useful way to go. Okay, so let's talk about... The other spell book. So the uh, the wizards have a pretty handy spell book. It's called Energy Nexus. Okay, this is a this is pre pre battle, so to speak, before a battle takes place in an area containing a wizard. So here we have Shogunifon coming to fight me. We'll get Sethago out of the way because he wouldn't want to fight him. And here's a couple of of servers of the Outer Gods helping him out for whatever help they offer, which is maybe not much. So they're coming here to fight me before the battle. Uh, the energy Nexus lets the side with the wizard do an action. Then the battle continues. So, for example, you could do the action of move. So you take your guys, move them out, you move two units. If you have Burrow, that only costs you one power. So for one power, you just escape the battle and it's, it's, like, it's canceled. So, for example, in the late game, you can be moving South Agua around with the wizard. When someone tries to come fight you, you use Energy Nexus to back out of the battle. And this is before pre-battle things happen, so it's really handy. You could also use it to do anything else. For example, you could use it to, uh, uh, if you had a gate in an area you came to fight you, you could summon a monster before the battle. Or you could curse lumber the gate out of the way so it can't be hurt. Or any, you can do any action. In theory, you could do the lethargy as your action, but that's kind of pointless because, I mean, for obvious reasons. So, wizards, energy nexus, you have so many things you can do, and it's impossible for you to describe them all because it's every action available to you is something you can do. Um, uh, it has to originate in the area, though. It has to be, sorry, it has to originate in the area. For example, you couldn't take an action of move more guys into the area, because that didn't originate in the area. You can move out, you can't move in. Okay? So, Energy Nexus. Okay, Serpent Men have a spell book. It's called Ancient Sorcery, because they're all ancient and sorcerous, as we know. And so what Ancient Sorcery does is you uh, spend one power, you remove a Serpent Pan from the map, and you put it on another player's faction sheet on his picture. Okay? And what this does is, for the rest of that turn, until the next Doom phase, um, you get to use that faction's special ability. For example, if you use this, if you put this on Crawling Chaos's sheet, 
then you could fly for the rest of that turn. And not only that, since you have burrow, you know, you can burrow and fly. So Sathagawa, along with another guy, can move two spaces. Uh, if you, it's not clear to me how he burrows and flies, but he's interdimensional and stuff, so it all works out. So uh, if you if you put it on uh, uh, Yellow Signs faction sheet, you get to copy the special ability of his faction, which is the Feast, which is you gain one power from areas that have a, a desecration marker. So then your units would get one power from desecrations too, and so forth. Now, if the faction special ability calls out a specific Great Old One by name, notably Cthulhu, who does this then it's as if Sethago was that person. So Cthulhu, for example, his special ability is when Cthulhu is eliminated, you get him back for only four, and you get an Elder Sign when you summon him, Sethago would get that ability if you copied Cthulhu's. So, uh, you know, if you can use Beyond One, if you copy Opener of the Way, and so forth. So there's a lot of different ways of using the, the ancient sorcery, again, it depends on who your opponents are, what the situation is. It's all very situational. Sathago has to be really flexible and see things how, how they are at the moment because it's a, uh, that's how he rocks. There is not a specific spellbook for the formless spawn. Uh, we figured that the fact that their combat goes up the more of them there are and you need them to summon Sathagawa are all interesting enough, plus they are the major source of your combat dice. Well, unless Sathagawa is fighting really early in the turn. Sathagawa has two awesome spell books that make him really, really cool. One of them is, uh, is a... Uh, enemies hate these spell books. Let me just make that clear. Here's the first one. Capture monster. Sathagoa can capture an enemy monster in the same way that other great old ones capture cultists. You can do it to monsters. So here's an example. Here is, here is Sathagoa in this area with these other monsters. Now he can't capture these servitors right now because they, there's an enemy great old one there, Shagrafon. So we'll move him over to here. He doesn't want to be there. So now here's enemy monsters. You say, I'm going to capture a monster. You pick up the monster and you put it on your card. It's that simple. During the next gather power, you return the monster to the enemy's pool and you get one power. doesn't matter how much the monster cost you only get one power for it. So it works like capture cultures. So for example, if you capture a mighty spawn of Yoxoth, which costs him four, you still only get one power. On the other hand, you captured a spawn of Yoxoth and paid one for it, so it's pretty nasty. That's one of the things that that uh, Scythagawa tends to do late in the turn after he's lethargied a lot. Uh, bop around the map, often with... You never move alone when you're... Uh, sleeper, because you have Burrow, and he'll move two at a time. So you walk around with your little... Cult, with your little uh, uh, well, often a uh, energy nexus uh, uh, wizard. But you walk around capturing monsters as you go, and when someone tries to fight you back, you use energy nexus to run away. So it's uh, it's pretty obnoxious. Another obnoxious ability he has is that of demand sacrifice. If Sathago was in play before the enemies attack you, they have a choice. They can choose either to lose a doom point or to let Sathagawa have an elder sign. Or is it a do point? No, it's an elder sign. It's an elder sign. If he refuses to do one of these options, then all of his dice that roll kills are changed to pains. He can't kill your guys. Well, he can if he spends a do point or gives you an elder sign. So, uh, but usually they hate that choice. They don't want to lose a do point. They certainly don't want to give you an elder sign. So they look sadly at you and, uh, you know, roll the dice and only pain you because that's what they have left available to them. So it's, your units are hard to kill because of Sathagwa, because they have to pay you to do it. Uh, you can capture their monsters, which, outside combat, you're not really into combat that much. Uh, you do have combat dice you can roll if you need to. Um, but, uh, but the fact that you take up a small footprint thanks to Cursed Lumber, and you have all these flexible flexible abilities to let you switch out things and move around. Every game you play with him is completely different because you're using the, the, the lizard men, their serpent men rather, in a different way, shouldn't call them that, so the serpent men in a different way to copy someone else's power and they just have so many options that sometimes for a brand new player he's kind of daunting because they, like, they have so many things they can do with Sleeper that they're not sure what they should do and uh, the answer is that, there's, that with all those options there's bound to be several that are all good. So try one of those. So that is a little introduction to Sleeper and the way he works. Thanks for watching.